Can I beat a Pokemon Infinite Fusion Hardcore Nuzlocke using only bug types? No healing in battle, level caps applied, it's simple, it's straightforward, but with a limited amount of bug type Pokemon available in this game, things are sure to get tricky come crunch time. Oh, did I forget to mention that everything is also randomized, so we'll have plenty of excitement and surprises along the way? This is gonna be fun, but can we do it? Let's find out. You guys know the drill by now. We make every other trainer in the game a cuck by forcing them to call us daddy. We come downstairs and our mom tells us that she's proud of us. Uh, wow. Nice to have that happen for once. However, she's clearly just in the early stages of Alzheimer's, as she forgets the name of the only other child who lives in town. Who will our rival be for this bug Pokemon only run? Well, there is a man out there in the YouTube universe known for using bug types in Nuzlocke, and his name is A-Drive. You know, almost a million subscribers, not a big deal. Today, we cuck him. We cuck a drive. Starter choosing time comes once again, folks. We've used Bulbasaur quite a bit lately in our other videos, so we decide to go with the tried and true Charmander this time around. A drive demands two starters, as he's apparently a spoiled rotten Nepo baby, and we still kick his ass in a 1v1. Take that, a drive. You definitely can't outshine me in any other ways. <laughs> <sighs> we grab the experience, we grab Oak's parcel, no, no homo, we grab our Pokedex, and we set off to officially begin our adventure. So, bug only Pokemon Nuzlocke, but I have a Charmander. Andrew, what exactly is going on here? Explain yourself, you may be saying. Well, we have every bug type available in the game already in our PC. As we get new encounters, we'll fuse them with the next bug type in the Pokedex. This means we're not only limited on the types of mons we have to fuse with, but we're also limited to only 17 encounters for this entire run. Some of these guys are gonna be powerful, and some not so much. Like our starter Charmander, who is forced to fuse with a Caterpie. You know, it's, uh, it's not much but it's honest work. Our first steps in this adventure bring us some fun encounters after Charmander though. In order, we grab up Spiro Weedle, Paris Merrill, Chimchar Venonat, Grovile Scyther, and Pichu Lediba. I'm especially a fan of this last one. Look at his damn face. Oh, he's just magical. The road to Brock's gym doesn't bring much challenge really, but it does bring a couple of evolutions. We see Wero and Catamander both evolve twice, giving us these two beauties. Although having evolved Pokemon this early is a nice power boost, they're still nowhere near the top two contenders on the team. These are the top two contenders, and this guy here is number one. Why? You know, I'll explain myself soon enough. For now, we bring these two real top two to the fight against Brock. He's rock hard. We're rock hard. We're both rock hard. Who's harder? Time to find out. Brock leads Pikachu Aaron, and we lead Grother. A vacuum wave and absorb combo is more than enough to take him out. Fecal is out next. Fecal, like, like, like poop, get it? <laughs> poop. <laughs> Two absorbs absolutely demolish the poop rock. Turns out not only is Brock not hard enough, Neither are his bowel movements. <laughs> Poop. Badge number one goes to us. We take off to the east, heading to Mount Moon. We crush every trainer in our path with absolutely zero challenge. Although Grother is a beast, the real carry is this little guy right here. Maris. Turns out, the Meryl portion of this fusion has the ability huge power. This doesn't just mean he's strong. This means he's the absolute biggest dick on campus. We devastate all that stand in our path all the way to Mount Moon. We calm down Nurse Joy, who's yapping nonstop about terrorism in the caves or some sh**, and prep ourselves for our next two encounters. The $500 Magikarp, an absolute staple, a classic. There's no way we were skipping this. Magikarp gets fused with a Spinarak, which isn't exactly the most powerful combo, but we'll take any fusion if Gyarados is involved. We hit up Mount Moon for the next encounter, which is a Dino. 
Now, this might seem like an amazing encounter, as Hydreigon would be a fantastic future Mon to have on the squad. However, level caps mean that we'll never really be able to get to a high enough level to evolve this thing, so that kind of blows. But we do, however, fuse it with Yanma, and we intend to use it anyway, as it currently has Dragon Rage, which is a fantastic move in the early game. We pack up the team, leave the Pokemon Center, and head into Mount Moon. The journey through Mount Moon itself isn't all too eventful other than foiling a terrace plot, like I said, uneventful. We also get to see a few evolutions, including Maris evolving into a Zoomerus. And there's barely a difference at all. He just basically put a big dumb smile on his face. I love him. We also evolve Buttermander and Venachar into their next forms. The butter looks smooth. The char, however, the, the char does not. Not even a little bit. We come down off the mountain and make our way into Cerulean City, ready to take on A-Drive once more and prove to everyone that I am clearly the far better Poketuber, despite all the evidence against that. A-Drive leads Vigoroth Cyndaquil and we lead with Grother. Not usually a good matchup, but we're packing that technician boosted rock tomb from Brock. We hit one doing huge damage and are hit back with Encore. Do it again? I mean, if you insist, little guy. A Drive uses a super potion, but we high roll this time around, picking up the KO. Zubat Cacnea is next. Another rock tomb? Don't mind if I do. It's an easy two hit KO. A Drive's Ace Squirt Sore is next up. We don't have much to hit it with, so we make the swap to b -Row. We take a bite on the switch, doing a decent chunk, and hit back with Twin Needle the following turn. Turns out, however, that Squirt Sore is not a grass type and is actually water poison. We barely do any damage, and we're hit back with a bubble, which does far more than we're comfortable with. We swap back to Grother and spam Rock Tomb until we grab the kill. Last out is Larva Bird, who doesn't put up much of a fight and dies to two Mega Drains. I will not lie to you, boys. I expected a lot more out of A-Drive. All those subscribers and he gets swept this badly? <laughs> Typical. And he's gonna run off salty about it? Super typical. We heal the team up and head up Nugget Bridge. We defeat all the trainers, say no to joining Team Rocket because they're all a bunch of cucks, and go looking for an encounter to the west. We find ourselves a Piplup in the grass, an excellent grab. We fuse it with the next bug type up, which is Pineco. It does admittedly look a little bit odd. Okay, okay, it looks very odd. But we know this thing will be an absolute defensive unit in the future, so we bring it along with us, replacing Daima. We leave back towards the north and defeat all the trainers along the way to Bill's house, seeing our new friend and an old friend evolve along the way. We arrive at Bill's house and Bill is... Well, Bill is Bill. King of the furries. We bully him for it, obviously. Why? Because furries deserve it. I will never change my mind on this matter. He gives us an SSN pass to make us go away, and we do just so, heading back to town to take on the next gym. Ah, <sighs> Misty. Poor, poor Misty. The absolute queen of 13-year-old boys everywhere in the 90s. It was a simpler time. It was a better time. She leads with Puku Muku Hoot Hoot. That took me about 18 tries to get down. And we lead with Grother. One Rock Tomb is enough to kill, but Innards Out hits us back and almost kills. Close call. Star You Need Areno is up next, but he isn't much of a challenge, going down to a Mega Drain and Wing Attack combo. Perhaps I'm too harsh on Misty. She did almost take out one of our best Pokemon. Then again, it was because of my own mistake. Perhaps I'm too confident about my intelligence? <laughs> nah, it couldn't be that. Badge number two belongs to us. We head straight south after beating Misty, taking the underground to Vermilion. There is a boat with our name on it, and we do not intend to be late to the party. The Pokeboat trainers are basically zero threat, but all the bonus XP does lead to a Zoomerus evolving into a Zoomasect. He... Looks derpy, odd, out of place, but still retained that big stupid smile on his face? 
I love him. While we're here, we head to the kitchen and grab some steaming crabby legs for a quest for this guy in the hotel. In return, he teaches us crab hammer, and we instantly teach it to our new out of place but derpy friend. This right here, one of the defining moments of the run. Huge power, plus base 100 damage, plus stab crab hammer? Most of the trainers may as well shit themselves and go to bed. We take our broken Pokemon back to the boat and approach a drive once again. As previously stated, he may as well shit his pants now and get it over with. A drive leads Dewblade Squirtle and we lead Buttermelian. We put it to sleep and spam fire pledges at it, but we're not doing as much damage as I would like. He wakes up and sets up a bit, which I very much dislike, so we make the switch to Veniferno. We have to take two Shadow Sneaks, but we do secure the KO with a couple of Mach Punches. Mudkip Pupitar is up next, so we stay in and just spam more Mach Punches at it. All it does is go for Bide and dies before even attempting to hit us back. A Drive's Ace Warsaur is out next. We know now that this thing is water poison, so we hit it with a few Psy Beams, taking it out with three of them. Victory Bell Mareep is the last Mon, and it barely chips us at all as we take it down with two turns of Flame Wheel. A fairly one-sided fight, and I didn't even need to bust out my broken Mons to do it. All those subscribers, yet no b is typical a drive runs off bitless may i add and we head into the touchy man's room who also has no bits unfortunately he demands that we the minor be his bitch instead i i i, I really don't want to talk about it we leave with the cut hm and try to forget about this traumatic experience as we make our way to the gym to take on surge it is time once more to take on the boomer the old man, the absolute joke, the guile wannabe. I don't know when I started hating this man, but I refuse to stop. He starts with Paris Lantern and we lead a Zuma set. A single play rough picks up the KO. Voltor Brockruff is sent out next and we get hit by an Electro Ball, but also put it to sleep with Spore. We want to KO with play Ruff in order to conserve our water gem, and I wasn't sure if Ruff would one-shot, but silly me, of course it does, because the power of Azuma Sect knows no bounds. Rotom Lycanroc is the last Mon, and I know for a fact that Surge sh his boomer pants when I hit this stab. Huge power, water gem boosted, super effective grab hammer. Lots of modifiers, lots of soiled garments. Surge is defeated with ease, and badge number three is ours. We double back to Cerulean and head east towards Rock Tunnel. There isn't a single trainer on the way that stands up to the might Azuma Sect and Growther have combined. Once we reach the Pokemon Center, we decide to check out the power plant in the south for a new encounter. We run into a Trubbish and snag it up. It's been a while since we caught something new, and you may be thinking I've been missing encounters by accident, but there is a method to the madness here. We only have a limited amount of encounters because there's a limited number of bug types to fuse with. However, if we can avoid some encounter using repels and being a little sneaky until we get to specific areas, we can guarantee ourselves stronger fusions. Trubbish gets fused with Shuckle, who comes out looking cute, but not very threatening. This will be a key piece to a future puzzle, however, so keep that in mind. We also encounter a Snubble in Rock Tunnel, which fuses with Heracross to make this absolute abomination. N not, not a fan, not even a little bit. But anyways, moving on. Rock Tunnel is traversed with no real incidents, but we do come across this interesting looking Pokemon egg in the cave. This must have been added in a recent update, I think, because this is brand new for me. I've never seen it. A bit later, we also get to watch our Prinko evolve into Printress. He's still pretty goddamn ugly, I won't lie, but more powerful. That's always fun. We reach the end of the tunnel and stroll our behinds into Lavender Town. We head straight to the PC because curiosity has gotten the best of me, and I can't wait to see what is inside this egg. We hatch it, revealing a Noibat. This, of course, is a fantastic Mon, and therefore a fantastic new encounter. We fuse it with Anrith to make an uglier version of Noibat. 
Lots of ugly little guys this run apparently, but power in the PC is something that we obviously absolutely adore. We box our newfound friend and head into Pokemon Tower where we encounter A-Drive once more, that slippery bastard. A-Drive leads with Chandelure Clefairy and we lead the hugely powerful Azumacept. We go for Spore, trying to conserve the Water Gem, but one shot the next turn with Play Rough anyway. This boy is just too damn strong. The Barrel Pikachu is up next, who is flattened by another Play Rough. Warsaur is next, who we Fury Cutter down over a few turns with ease. Ladia Scizor hits the field out of f***ing nowhere. This early in a run, is A-Drive out here genning Mons for this run? Despicable. We teach him a lesson by hitting a Spore into a Play Rough, and it dies so fast that it had me thinking of that one scene from Terminator 2. Hasta la vista, baby. A Drive was absolutely thrashed in this fight. I can feel all his viewers clicking off his videos and subscribing to my channel as I speak. We laugh in our rival's face, eavesdrop on a Team Rocket conversation about a hostage scenario or some shit, and leave to head west towards Celadon. There are a lot of trainers on the way to the big city, and we take full advantage of all that free experience, using it to evolve Veniferno along the way. We run through the underground once again and walk into the big city ready to fight me some terrorism. But first, we do have an errand to run. We've got a free gift encounter waiting for us in the form of this cute little Eevee event, and we grab it up as soon as we can. The encounter randomizes into a Sandy Ghast, which makes for an odd-looking Nencata fusion. Not exactly the most powerful fusion, but a ground type. That could probably prove useful when the Fire Gym comes around, just saying. We throw it in the box and head to the sewers to confront Team Rocket. Oh boy, the Rockets. Terrorism has never looked quite as autistic as this. We sweep through every trainer in our way, laughing as we go, until we finally come to our showdown with Giovanni. He leads Piplup Swampert, and we lead Grother. One Leaf Blade is all it takes. Dark Rise Shuppet is second, who lives a wing attack and chunks us for about a third of our health. One more wing attack takes it down easily the following turn, though. Alakazam Sandy Gas is the last Mon who actually lives a Leaf Blade somehow, but uses its turn to set up a Reflect. Close call, not gonna lie. We may have been in range for a Psychic kill there, or even a Psybeam, honestly, considering Alakazam's special attack. Giovanni sure seemed like a pushover, but there was at least a gleam of a threat there near the end. We collect our new Sylph Scope and head to the gym, eager to pick up badge number four. Erica sends out Mimikyu Grodel, and we lead the staple, the classic, the go-to, Grother himself. We start off with a wing attack, breaking its disguise, and we are hit back with a charm. An actual good move choice. <laughs> Erica is already surprising us. We make the switch to Buttermelian and take another charm on the switch. This time though, obviously it's useless. We fire off back to back fire pledges for an easy KO. Slow King Grovile is out next, and this thing I'm actually a little bit cautious of. My caution is proven worthy, as Slowvile hits a Zen headbutt, taking us well below half health, and flinching us as well. We swap to B-Row, kind of accepting that he may need to be sacked here, but Slowvile goes for Water Pulse, and we stay above half health. We outspeed next turn and hit a Bug Gem boosted Pin Missile, taking down Slowvile. Ivysaur Toxapex is Erica's last Mon who's dispatched with two Aerial Aces. That was a bit of a close one. Losing a Mon there would have certainly been a devastating blow to our squad. Should we maybe start taking Erica a little bit more seriously? <laughs> nah, badge number four belongs to us. After healing up, we head east back to Lavender Town, where we use our new Sylph Scope to climb the floors of Pokemon Tower. We defeat all the spooky demon goblin ghost phantom females who give us enough experience to see Printress evolve into his final form. Finally, he's not a mess of pixelated colors and is instead this thick ass looking unit. Empotris is born and I couldn't be happier about it. We get to see the final form of Veniferno as well, who evolves into, well, not the prettiest looking thing around, but certainly one of the more powerful things around. I'm happy with him too, 
despite his struggles with beauty. We make it all the way to the top of the tower when we're approached by a ghost lady. Ooh, spooky. She fights us with her Venomoth, Klefki, who outspeeds Azuma Sect and almost kills him with a signal beam. Okay, I take it back. It, it was just a joke. That, that was actually spooky. Luckily for us, however, the power of Azuma Sect is absolutely monstrous, and we one-shot it back with Crab Hammer. We shake it off and head to the final floor, where Mr. Fuji gives us the Polka Flute. We leave Pokemon Tower, ready to start the transition into the late game. We head south to fight the Snorlax blocking our path, excited about the possibility of a very strong encounter. However, we kind of get screwed over a little bit. As the dad of Nuzlocks, you know I only play with dupes claws, which means I was quite sad to see Snorlax be randomized into Empoleon. We kill it, sad about the loss of a powerful new ally, and move on. We only have four more encounters left, the next bug type up being the legendary Genesect, and we were really looking forward to a power combo with this Snorlax randomization. Oh well, it is what it is. We head back to Celadon and take out the second Empoleon waiting for us to the west before taking on the trainers of Cycling Path. All the free experience leads to both Buttermelian and Growther evolving, giving our team quite the nice power spike. And let me tell you, it was perfect timing because we run into this biker here who has a damn Dialga Mankey right before Fuchsia. Look at this thing, Jesus Christ. We quickly defeat it, allowing us to stroll into town with a big head on our shoulder and between our legs and head straight to our face off with Koga. Koga, the cosplayer, the otaku, the weeb, the absolute Chad himself. You can call this guy whatever you like. He knows what he's about. And today he is about leading with Vibrava Victory Bell as we're all about leading with Empatris. We started this way in order to set up spikes, so we go right for them, but eat a heavy hitting earthquake first, taking us below half. We're forced to switch into Charfri, who, thank God, is immune to the incoming earthquake. We hit Flame Burst on back-to-back -back turns to secure the KO. Deidre Tentacruel comes out next, so we go into Empatris again, hoping for another layer of spikes. We get taken really low in order to set it up, but we do pull it off. We do not want to lose Empatris here, so we switch into Azumasect. We're hit with Brine and land a Spore in return. This thing is part poison type, so it doesn't take as much damage from our moves as we were hoping. We also haven't seen all four moves from this thing yet, so we may get hit with a poison move at any moment. We decide to hit another Spore once this thing wakes up, then switch to B-Row. The Big Dick B hits two drill runs on a sleeping Sea Cruel to pick up the kill. Genesect Arbok is out next, and honestly, I'm pretty scared. We're hoping that it's Poison Steel as we go for Drill Run, but it is not. So we do pitiful damage to it. We're hit with a Flame Charge, meaning it now outspeeds us. We know we can't allow anything to take a big hit from this thing, so we stay in and we spam Aerial Ace. We get it just above dying before ultimately falling ourselves. B-Row is no more. We bring Charfree back out and hit a Flame Burst for the KO. Letty and Bulbasaur is the last Mon out, who's easily cleaned up with another back-to-back -back Flame Burst. We're getting to the point now where gym leaders like this one have legendary fusions to deal with, and the overall power of our bug types is clearly being called into question. We were able to survive this time, but we definitely felt the pressure. You can discount a lot of trainers in this game, but never discount the cosplaying Chad known as Koga. Badge number five belongs to us. We hit the PC and make our dead box, placing B-Row in it. This was our first encounter after our starter and it doesn't feel good at all to lose him. We peruse the PC and search for a new team member and decide that it's about time we put our potential Gyarados to good use. We level him up all the way to his final form and he looks absolutely terrifying. Fell Stinger is an easy way to get plus three attack and that should lead to some amazing sweeps. You know, <laughs> hopefully. We put him on the squad, grab Surf from the Safari Zone and head towards Saffron. 
Saffron City is the true start of the late game, and I feel like we're fairly well prepared for it. The Rockets have, of course, taken over Silphco. Terrorism has rocked the city. Time to go Hulk Hogan on their ass and bring Silphco a little freedom, brother. We bash through all the grunts, gaining enough experience to see Scepter evolve into his final form. He looks nothing short of glorious, and it gets even better when we discover this alternative sprite. Look at the power. Using this newfound power, getting to the top floor is a breeze. We get rewarded for victory with a free encounter. It turns out to be a Magna Zone, an absolutely phenomenal pairing with our next mon up to fuse with, the legendary Genesect. We fist pump the air, take the teleporter to the final floor, and walk towards the Giovanni fight. We are, however, rudely interrupted by A-Drive. Clearly he's just salty about me taking all of his viewers, it's time to put him in his place. A-Drive leads with Haunter Rhyperior and we lead Empotris. We go for a swagger and miss, giving our rival a free Dark Pulse. Luckily for us, we absolutely eat it up. We hit the swagger in the next turn, and Honperior hits itself in confusion. We take the next few turns to set up Toxic Spikes and Spikes, while we high roll the absolute sh** out of confusion, eventually picking up the KO without even clicking a damage move. Sand Slash High Dragon is next. We take only a single slash from this thing before KOing it with two surfs due to Quick Claw coming in clutch. Beware Armaldo comes out and we chance staying in in order to hit a surf. It hits us with Thrash and our surf doesn't kill as it turns out it isn't a rock type. Thank God we were not hit with a fighting move. We switch to Sepzor to resist Thrash and still get chunked to almost half health. Holy sh**, this thing is busted. We outspeed and hit an Iron Head for the KO the next turn without too much issue though. Thank God that is over with. Hopip Cafagragus is sent out next and we mop it up easily without even taking any damage. War Turtle Venusaur is A-Drive's last Mon and it dies instantly to a Stab Leaf Blade. The fight was fairly one-sided yet again, but there was definitely a bit more a threat in there than last time. We get our Mons healed and A-Drive decides to stand by our sides as we take on Mr. Terrorism himself, Giovanni. Osama Bin Laden leads with Dewblade Haunter and Alakazam Fracture. We lead Gariados Ariados <laughs> and A-Drive leads Golbat Ursaring. We outspeed everything on the field and hit a Bug Gem boosted Fell Stinger on the Alakazam Fracture for a huge one hit KO and a plus three attack boost. Duder hits a Night Slash on Gold Ring and Gold Ring wastes its turn by going for Venishock on the Steel type. Great, just absolutely great, A Drive. Prime Ape Low Punny is out next and b boys, please, no, no more comments about the Low Punnies. Please, I'm begging you. Prime Punny hits Golring with a stomping tantrum, dealing huge damage, and we hit it back with a Fell Stinger, which only does about a quarter. We take some chip from Duder, and Golring goes for. mean, look. Great. Thanks, A Drive. Prime Punny takes Golring down with another tantrum, and we hit it back with a nice fang missing out on the KO. We take some more chip from Duder and A-Drive sends out Espeon Muck. We're looking at that low health Prime Punny thinking plus six attack sounds pretty sick right now. So we go for another Fell Stinger. We forgot that uh, Dodoy, Giovanni has potions and he heals Prime Punny up to full. We hit the Fell Stinger doing a third, Duder wastes its turn and Muck goes for a Psychic bringing Prime Punny back down to deep red. I am seeing red at this point, focused on nothing but getting this damn plus six attack with Fell Stinger. I'm so focused in on it that I forget one thing. I'm in range. Prime Punny hits us with a thrash, taking Ariados out. This was probably my biggest mistake of the run. It hurts a lot. Muck takes some chip and KOs Prime Punny with another psychic. Giovanni sends out Golduck Armaldo and we send out Azumasect, who devastates Duder with a water gem crab hammer. We spore the Golmaldo the next turn and clean it up easily. Losing a Mon never feels good, especially when you know you could have done better. However, we push through the pain and move on. Giovanni runs off and we're gifted with a free Turtwig as our next encounter. 
We also grab our Master Ball and finally head back to the Pokemon Center. We hit the PC and put Ariados in the dead box. It starts dawning on us just how crucial of a loss this was. Intimidate is so clutch in the end game, and honestly all of the game, and we let it go out of sheer stupidity. Luckily for us, however, we do have something powerful waiting for us. We grab the Magnezone we were gifted in Sylphco and fuse it with the next bug type up. Genesect. The impressive frame of Magnesect is officially born. The bug next up after Genesect is Joltik, so it gets fused with our new Turtwig. We haven't run into many cute bug fusions in our travels, but this guy? This guy right here? Oh, he's f***ing adorable. We put him in the box and add Magnesect to the team. We quickly stop by the NYPD offices and are gifted a life orb for our valiant efforts in defeating terrorism. We leave the cop stop, pissing on the doormat on the way out, <laughs> and head towards the gym, ready to finally claim badge number six. Sabrina leads Zatu Glalie and we lead Empatris. We get up a layer of toxic spikes before being hit with a confuse ray. We hit ourselves twice over the next two turns and get chipped down to almost half so we decide to make the swap to Charfree. We eat a Psychic on the Switch, bringing us to just above half, but are able to one-hit KO it back with a Heat Wave. Ammonite Deoxys comes out next, and nothing on my team wants to take a Psychic from this thing. We stay in and go for a Sleep Powder, but poor little Charfree is absolutely nuked by an Ancient Power. Our starter goes down. This one feels personal. We shrug it off the best we can and go into Empatris once more. We go for Swagger, hoping to stall some extra turns for more hazards, but first we take a Mud Shot. We take the chance and stay in for a Surf. We're hit with Brine, which luckily doesn't kill, and we one-shot it back with a huge Crit Surf. Oricolio Nidoking comes out next, so we make the swap to Magnesect, taking an Air Slash on the Switch. We hit a Flash Cannon, bringing it really low, and Sabrina heals up over the next few turns, forcing us to eat chip damage from Life Orb. By the time we pick up the KO, we've been brought to 20 HP. Bastiodon Latios is Sabrina's last Mon, and oh boy, I do not have to explain to you how this thing is clearly a threat. We switch to Vena Ape, wanting to preserve Magnesect and eat an Ancient Power on the Switch. We hit a Bug Gem boosted Leech Life and pick up a one hit KO. This was far closer than I was comfortable with. We lost one Mon and came real close to losing another. The late game is clearly nothing to scoff at. We salute Sabrina for a good fight and a job well done, and we mentally prepare ourselves for the aftermath. Badge number six belongs to us. We place Charfri into the dead box, remembering all the great times we spent together. We have no great fit to replace him, but we level up and evolve Palosan Ninjask to add to the team for now. Blaine is our next challenge, and Palo Jask may prove useful in that fight. We take off for the high seas, using repels to avoid encounters along the way, and arrive in Cinnabar, ready for Blaine. This is definitely the hardest gym fight of the run for us. Fire obviously has an awesome matchup against bugs, and most of the mons that we've been able to fuse to give us differing typings, like Sepzor, still have a bad matchup against Fire. We say a little prayer and face off with Blaine. He leads with Low Punny Magmar, and we lead Empotris. This turns out to be a perfect matchup for us, as it can only hit us with Dizzy Punch. So we take full advantage to set up the maximum amount of hazards before KOing it with a Surf. By far the best lead we could ask for. Moltres Hypno is next who hits heavy with a flamethrower, but we're able to KO with a Surf after damage from all of the hazards. Ninetales King is next up, and we definitely do not want to stay in, as Embotris is burned and deep in the red. We swap to Palojask and get taken to the deep yellow by a hard-hitting crit flamethrower. We're not sure if we can outspeed this thing, but we are sure that we can KO it. We're hit with a lucky break as Blaine decides to use a full restore. We hit back with a ground gem boosted earth power and pick up the one hit KO. Magmortar Giratina is Blaine's last mon and boy oh boy this Satan spawn from hell is looking powerful. However, we do have one thing going for us. 
a very good type matchup. We outspeed, hit another earth power, and it's a one hit KO once again. Without Blaine throwing by healing at the wrong time, this could have turned out a lot worse. Luckily for us, we had some good speed tier matchup and a perfect lead to set up a victory. The late game keeps throwing hooks at us and we just keep on dipping and dodging. Badge number seven belongs to us. Now comes the most stressful of times in any Infinite Fusion run, the Legendary Birds fight. Once again, we are facing a horrible matchup. We have nothing to resist everything this fight wants to hit us with, but we do have a couple of tricks up our sleeve. We chase after Team Rocket, climb Mount Ember, beat up all the grunts, and run back to Cinnabar quick to prepare for the fight. We've been keeping some secret weapons in the PC, and it is time to finally use them. The easiest way to dispatch of this fight is to use rock moves. So we bring along our two rock types, Armaldo Neuvern and Garbador Shuckle. We also bring Raichu Ledian with us so that we can lead with it and set up a light screen and possibly even reflect if we're lucky. Finally, we bring Granbull Heracross as Death Fodder and Magnesect for one last hurrah if the other five can't get the job done. This is a huge gamble because we're entrusting the rest of the run to just our regular team and the next two encounters if we lose most of our team in this fight. But I do think it's our best bet of not getting wiped out by the birds here. We make sure everyone is at the level cap, equip some items, teach some moves, and head back to Mount Ember. It's time for the hardest fight of every run. The legendary battle begins. We lead with Letty Chu and set up a light screen right away. We're hit back with Flamethrower, Ice Beam, and Drill Pack. No surprise here, Letty Chu goes down. But he did his job and that's what counts. We send out Garbuckle next and go for a Rock Gem boosted Rock Slide. We have to eat an Ice Beam and a Drill Pack first, but Light Screen does a great job of helping us tank these moves. We hit back with the Rock Slide, proccing all three of the bird's Charty Berries and get some good chip on all of them. We keep with the same approach the following turn, eating up a few moves to bring us down to yellow, but this time taking out Moltres with the Rock slide and bringing the other two parts of the birds to half. We go for rock slide yet again the next turn, but are hit with some bad RNG and get frozen by Ice Beam. We have no choice but to leave Garbuckle in and let him go down. We send out Armvern next, who's packing Ancient Power, and target Zapdos with it. It is also boosted by Rock Gem, and it takes Zapdos out with ease. We're hit back with an Ice Beam, bringing us down to just 17 HP, but one more Ancient Power is enough to kill the Articuno, winning us the fight. Giving up only two Mons here is probably best case scenario for us, and we rub it in Giovanni's face before he runs off like the absolute coward he is. We are left with just one more task to complete before leaving. Moltres. It's waiting for us, and we're not leaving without taking it with us as our next encounter. We face it down, and it's been randomized into a Regice. We use our Master Ball to snag it up, and head back to Cinnabar, ready to transition from the late game right on into the end game. We hit the PC and put Garbuckle and Letty Chew into the dead box. They may be gone, but they're certainly not forgotten, as I don't think we could have won this run without them. We fuse our new Regice with our next bug up, which is Larvesta. The fusion is an ugly looking one, but this thing is going to be a potential carry when it hits its final form. We add Regiesta to the squad, bring out the rest of the regular team, and head to Viridian to face Giovanni for the final time. One last badge, one last challenge, one last gym fight. Ground typing is a fairly good matchup for us, but at this point in the endgame, nothing is off the table. It is time to begin the end. We match Giovanni's stare and we jump into battle. He leads with Gliscor Electivire and we lead the mighty Azumasect. We take a Sky Uppercut for a quarter of health and one shot back with an Ice Punch. Talonflame Onyx is next, who hits us with a Flame Charge and lives a Crab Hammer due to its sturdy ability. 
At this point, we are definitely in range for a flying type move to kill us. However, nothing on our team really wants to take a flame charge or an earthquake. We decide to go to Vena Ape as it's our least valuable team member and Giovanni full restores on the switch. We go for a gem boosted leech life, hoping for a bit of healing back after we take a hit. We take another flame charge and after healing, we're left at 130 HP. Giovanni full restores again and our close combat only does a third. With our stats now lowered and a ground move not yet being revealed, we go to Empatrist and just in time too, as a flying move is finally used. We're hit on the switch and the following turn by Acrobatics, but both do nothing. We go for Swagger, but we miss. We go for a second Swagger the following turn and, and miss again. Then I ask myself, why am I bothering with Swagger? And we go for a four times effect of Surf instead which finally picks up the KO. Groudon Swablu is up next. We expect an Earthquake, so we swap to Vena Ape, and an EQ does indeed come out. We eat it up and burn it back the following turn with Willow. Now that this thing's offense is crippled, we spam Leech Life at it until it goes down. Regice Stiglet comes out, and we simply click Close Combat for the next KO. Giovanni's final Mon is Palo Sand Electivire, who we burn expecting a physical move. We get hit by Earth Power instead though, and Vena Ape is brought deep into the red. We swap to Sepzor, and Palovire goes instead for a Giga Drain, which barely even tickles. A single Leaf Blade is all it takes to pick up the KO and secure the victory. Giovanni didn't go down without a fight, but it wasn't nearly enough of a fight to break the impenetrable wall that is our team of bug boys. The final gym badge belongs to us. We leave the gym and do a bit of leveling up now that our level cap is higher. We finally get to see Regirona, the final form of our Volcarona Regice fusion. It's uh, it's still pretty fucking ugly, but I know for a fact that this thing is now one of, if not the strongest mon on our team. It's absolutely perfect timing too, because before we take our stroll down victory road, there is one more obstacle to overcome. A drive. Not the last time we'll see him, but still annoying nonetheless. He is growing saltier by the minute. His viewers keep subscribing to Legacy Andrew just like you should. They keep watching my Nuzlocks instead of buying his G Fuel flavor. He's absolutely irate, and we're here to rub salt in the wound. A Drive leads Electivire Slagu, and we lead Empotris. He sets up Light Screen turn one, but we go for Swagger, hoping for a few free turns to set up hazards. We get both Toxic Spikes and all three spikes up over the next five turns, but play fast and loose with Empotris's life to get there, living a Thunder Punch on just four HP. We make the swap to Regirona, who eats a Discharge on the switch and gets paralyzed. This is not a great spot to be in. We take a screech and go for ice beam, but we're fully parried. We're hit with a thunder punch next turn and we live on just 4 HP once again. We hit back with ice beam, picking up the KO safely though. Flaffy Celebi is up next and we're feeling the pressure. We make the swap to Sepzor, who takes a signal beam fairly well. We hit an iron head doing about a third health and pick up a flinch. With the spikes and toxic damage, we're able to KO the next turn. Magneton Knocked Owl is next up, which isn't a great matchup for us, so we swap to Magnesect. It takes two turns because of Sturdy, but we're able to easily clean up the Magna Owl. Blastsaur, A Drive's Ace, is next in line. An easy Oko with Thunderbolt. Waylord Snorlax comes out, who is another easy Thunderbolt Oko. Zorua Zuelis is last, and Bug Buzz is enough to KO it two times over. Using a suicide lead without the ability to actually let it suicide is proving to be a tough strat to pull off, but it's clearly doing wonders once it's actually set up. A Drive runs off once more, muttering something about G Fuel sales, and we run after him, ready to take on the run's final challenge. Victory Road may be an absolute cakewalk for our team, but we're not focused on the trainers. The fights are as one-sided as ever, but our eyes are on a different prize. There lurks a certain high-powered Pokemon in the depths of this cave, and we've been saving our last encounter this entire time just for this moment. 
we reach the Entei who's waiting for us almost with glee. We jump into battle and Entei has been randomized into Celebi. We catch it with general ease and leave Victory Road ready to finally see our team at its highest power level. Celebi is fused with Venipede and its final form is... cute? Wait, I, I really wasn't expecting cute, but is it powerful? Oh, you're damn right it's powerful. Having a Psychic type on the team for some coverage is going to help us out quite a bit. We're ready to finally end this run once and for all. Our final team for the Elite Four is as follows. Empotris with Sturdy, rocking Surf, Spikes, Toxic Spikes, and Swagger. The Suicide Lead, the Big Boy, the Unwavering Immovable Object. This thing's job is simple and straightforward. Take hits, get up hazards, be available for water coverage. Swagger lets us stall for extra turns, especially against special attackers. Quick Claw often lets us swagger our surf opponents before they even move. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Leading Epitris has got us this far, and I have no intentions of stopping. Regirona with Flame Body. Packing Fiery Dance, Quiver Dance, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt. One of the later additions to the team, but an absolute banger nonetheless. This thing looks ugly, and its fights are even uglier. Most mons will not live an Ice Gem boosted Ice Beam from this thing. Even less mons will live anything from it once it's boosted a couple of times with Fiery Dance or Quiver Dance. This thing can 1v1 just about anything that isn't a rock type. It completes the team in a big way. Magnusect with Download, sporting Flash Cannon, Flamethrower, Bug Buzz, and Thunderbolt. With the addition of Life Orb, this thing can hurt everyone. We bring this thing in for absolute brute strength. Free special attack boosts from Download make this guy the ultimate tool in keeping up momentum. It's an all-out attacking mon for the ages on a team that takes full advantage of momentum and offense. If we hadn't picked up this thing when we did, the run may have been over. Now he's here to make sure we come out with a victory. Sepzor with Technician. He's got Leaf Blade, Dual Chop, Iron Head, and Earthquake. Have you noticed the Hyper Offense pattern yet? If not, this mon should confirm the strategy for you. Dual Stab options with Blade and Iron Head deal out huge damage, with Earthquake as coverage. Dual Chop is boosted by Technician into a heavy hitting 120 base power attack that hits for neutral on most mons. This thing just keeps firing attacks and has a great defensive typing to shield it from a lot of damage. He's our main guy to go to when faced with rock types and shines on the team because of it. Many tough situations are broken through via the power of Grass Gem Boosted Leaf Blade, which means Sepsor is one of the big reasons we've gotten this far in the run to begin with. This guy was part of our original team of six starting out, and I couldn't be happier to still have it with me for the run's hardest challenge yet. Celipede with Poison Point. We've given it Psychic, Shadow Ball, Sludge Bomb, and Recover. This guy's got it all. Stacking Black Sludge with the option to use Recover means that this thing is incredibly difficult to knock out. It sticks to the field and is a great go-to for when Empatris is threatened by a fighting move and has to switch turn one of a fight. It hits hard, it stays alive, and it even poisoned things that hit it directly. It was the level up the team needed to bring it to its true endgame form. Without this guy, we may have lacked the power and sustain to truly make it through to the end. And last but not least, Azuma Sect with huge power. Rocking Crab Hammer, Play Rough, Ice Punch, and Spore. The one and only, my absolute favorite. Picking up huge power as one of our first three encounters of the run was the absolute blessing that this run needed to survive. Bug types tend to start being kind of useless around the 20 to 30 level mark, so without this guy to conquer the mid game like he did, there was zero chance we'd get all the way to the end like we are right now. Water Gem boosted huge power stab crab hammer are words that I will forever remember fondly. He's the reason we're here. He's the reason I'm not wasting 15 hours of footage and moving on to another run. He's the reason I'm able to make this video. And for that, I'm proud as hell to bring him through those doors to face the end of the run with me. Once more, as with our other infinite fusion runs, we've crafted a very hyper-offensive team. 
This game rewards players that can craft a squad with high damage output and use typings and abilities to buff their defense instead of raw stats. Even with being forced into using bug type Pokemon in every fusion, we've been able to balance our team fairly well, adding a hazard setter to guarantee kills where we may have otherwise missed out due to the generally lower stats of our bugs. But there is still one final challenge to overcome. We get the team arranged, we double check our moves and items, and head through those fateful doors once more. It's time for this run to end. Lorelei is always kind of a mixed bag. It seems you either struggle against her or completely demolish her. We're hoping for the latter this time around. She leads Regirock, Glaceon, and we lead, as per usual, Empotris. This is a great matchup, and we're able to get up all five layers of hazards, burn a full restore, and take them on out for the cost of Empotris going into the red. Galvantula Kiram is out next, and we definitely want to get Empotris out of there. We swap to Regirona and take barely anything from a signal beam on Switch. We take an Electro Ball the next turn and are able to Oko back with Fiery Dance. Delibird Giratina is sent out, and we take the chance to set up a Quiver Dance. Delatina goes for present which misses hilarious we hit a fiery dance and pick up the kill snow runt rayquaza is up next and being plus one means that we're able to easily one hit ko it as well articuno polyworld comes out and it's another easy oko this time with thunderbolt i said it in the team preview and i'll say it again not many mons live once Regirona gets up a quiver dance. Lorelei's weak ass is clearly no exception. One down, four to go. The gigantic hunk of man meat known as Bruno is opponent number two. Am I intimidated by this man? <laughs> yes. But am I intimidated by his Pokemon team? Also, yes. Yeah, he's known for Onyx. Yeah, if he has other rock types, this could be trouble. We jump into battle with our booty holes fully clenched. Bruno leads Charizard Gallade, and we lead the one and only Empatris. We don't want to give this thing free moves, but we can threaten it, so we go for Surf. Our Quick Claw pops, and we one-hit KO it with that Surf. My man, Empatris, what an absolute unit. Charmeleon Primeape is out next. We have to eat a Flamethrower this time, but we once again pick up the one-hit KO. Cradilly Breloom gets sent out. Our first bad matchup guess we're facing this one without hazards because Empatris wants none of this fight. We swap to Celipede and Cradloom gets a free stockpile up on the switch. We hit it with Psychic, bringing it to half and easily eat up the energy ball that's tossed back at us. Bruno wastes a full restore in the next turn, but ultimately dies the turn after that to Psychic number three. Shuckle Primeape is up next and we spam Psychic at it until it lives on what must be one or two HP. He gets up a sticky web and Bruno switches it out the next turn before I can KO it, bringing out Lucario Zatu instead. We hit it with a free Shadow Ball, which lowers its special defense, which means that Sludge Bomb is an easy KO the following turn. All Bruno has left is the Shuckle Prime Ape now, and we clean it up the next turn. Bruno, the Pokemon trainer, almost never holds up to the absolute aura of Bruno the man. And for that, I am very appreciative. Two fights down, three to go. Agatha's old pervert ass is up next. I am not letting this go, ladies and gentlemen. She is throwing down sexual vibes. I'm not saying I'm about it. Well, maybe I'm a little bit about it, but generally speaking, I am disgusted. We are a minor in this game. For shame, Agatha, for shame. We jump into battle to teach her a lesson. She leads Drifblum Regice, and we lead once more with the iconic unit known as Empatris. Turn one, we swap Toxic Spikes for an Amnesia. Turn two, Agatha Baton passes into Miss Magius Ampharos as I set up a second layer of T-Spikes. I am clearly very threatened by this thing, so we swap out to Sepzor, who takes an Astonish, <laughs> what? On Switch. We hit an Earthquake the following turn for the one-hit KO. Drift Bice comes back in, getting poisoned by our Spikes. This causes Agatha to use a full restore as we hit hard with an iron head, bringing Drift Bice down into the yellow. 
Agatha burns another full restore before falling to a third iron head the following turn. Giraffe Rig Trevenant gets sent out and, uh, hmm, thanks. I hate it. We hit it with a Grass Gem Boosted Leaf Blade and the thing practically explodes. Mistravis Yan Mega is next who outspeeds us and hits a Shadow Ball, dealing about a third. We hit back with Dual Chop, doing a good chunk of damage. We get greedy and stay in for the kill and end up being brought to the red by another Shadow Ball. No crits though, so we're able to secure the KO, thank God. Banette Kiram is Agatha's last Mon and we're able to easily take care of it by switching to Regiru and hitting a fiery dance. We got a bit greedy there with Sepzor, but ultimately the fight was fairly easy. The caliber of Mons to face is clearly ramping up though, as many Mons are now just straight up legendaries. But even with all that power, Agatha still got crushed. Serves her right for going full Mr. Beast and hitting on a miner like that. Three fights down, two to go. The iconic, the legendary, the cape wearing, the autistic man himself Lance is our next obstacle. Can his hyper obsessive behavior prove too much for us to overcome? Time to find out. Lance leads Garchomp Beedrill and we lead the also iconic, also legendary, but not autistic Empatris. We get up two layers of T-Spikes before Gardrill goes for a dig. We make the swap to Azumasect, who's able to tank the dig and next turn slash with ease before hitting Gardrill with a spore. We then go for an ice punch and it's an easy one hit KO. Reshiram Whirlipede is sent out who hits us hard with a Dragon Pulse as we put it to sleep with yet another spore. We miss our first play rough, but we do land the next turn bringing Reshipede into the yellow. We are not comfortable being this low when Reshipede could possibly wake up, so we swap back Back out to Empatris. Our Quick Claw procs turn one and we hit a swagger. RNG is not kind to us though, as Reshapede breaks through confusion on all three of the next turns. We are, however, able to tank the hits long enough to set up another three layers of spikes before Empatris goes into the red. We make the swap to Celipede, who tanks a slash on the switch. We hit a psychic the next turn, heal up with recover the next, and finally KO with a shadow ball on the third turn. Gabite Entei is out next and is dealt with easily in exchange for about 60 of our health. Zekrom Crobat is sent out next and we take the opportunity to heal up once more. Zekbat doesn't do enough with Zen Headbutt or with Fusion Bolt to really threaten us all too much, and we're able to easily clean it up with two Psychics, even getting to heal with Recover for a turn in between. Lance's last Mon is Wigglytuff Dialga. This thing is damn ugly, but it is no doubt powerful. Luckily for us, all it can hit us with is Double Slap before our two Sludge Bombs take it out. We prove once again that I, Legacy Andrew, am the king of Pokemon Autism. I'd say I'm surprised, but I'm not. We collect ourselves and move on to the next room. The end is finally upon us. The final showdown. Who will take the title of the king of bug-only YouTube Nuzlocks? Will it be us, or will it be a drive the time is now subscribers street cred ad revenue everything is on the line we meet a drive's eye give him a little smirk and jump into the fray a drive leads slacking glaceon and we lead with the gentleman and scholar himself empatris Amon with the truant ability, the absolute perfect thing to set up hazards on. We set up all five layers of hazards and land a swagger while taking barely any damage at all. We even have time to start spamming Surf, which leads to A-Drive burning four of his full restores before we finally pick up the KO. I could not have asked for a more perfect opening for the final battle. Palkia Eradicate comes out and we stay in to hit a swagger. We do have to eat an Aqua Tail first, but it practically tickles the immovable object known as Empatris. Next turn, Palkicate hits the Hydro Pump, which does a massive chunk of damage, and we hit back with a Surf, which combines with poison damage to bring Palkicate below half. We stay in one more time, and this turn, Palkicate hurts itself in confusion, meaning that our Surf picks up the kill. Waylord Trevenant is next up, 
so we decide to finally tell Empatress that he can rest, so we switch to Sepsor. We take a Horn Leech on the switch, which barely affects us. We hit a Grass Gem boosted Leaf Blade and pick up the KO due to the poison and spike damage. Fortress Garchomp is out next, and I don't know if this thing is insanely cool or positively stupid. Either way, we go for an Iron Head, but get hit by a Zap Cannon, paralyzing us and skipping our turn. We get fully parried again the next turn, but Forachomp only tickles us slightly with a Gyro Ball. A Drive's turn number three is then wasted on Magnet Rise as we finally break through Paralysis to land a Dual Chop, bringing Chomp into the red. We're paralyzed again the next turn, but it doesn't matter as Poison ultimately takes the Forachomp down. A Drive's Ace Blast Soar comes out. He's here to deny us more subscribers. We cannot let that happen. Even though we're paralyzed, we stay in as this matchup is quite good for us. Blast Soar sets up an Iron Defense and we land an Earthquake, which does about a third. We're hit the next turn with Hydro Pump though, dealing a good chunk and getting fully parried again. Blastsaur sets up a Rain Dance the following turn, and we hit another Earthquake, bringing Blastsaur into the red, before Leftovers healing that is. We get fully paralyzed again the next turn as Blastsaur sets up for a Skull Bash. With his defense now at plus three, and with us knowing Skull Bash is coming, we swap to Magna Set who's barely damaged by the attack on the switch. We outspeed and hit a Thunderbolt, picking up the KO. A-Drive's final Mon is Muck Beware. The end is here, and I want one Mon at my side when it happens. We make the swap to our good friend Azumaset, the early game carry that brought us here, ready to end this run with an epic piece of cinema, and we're one hit KO'd by a gunk shot. So much for the cinema. Guess I'll have to hide my pain under the sweet taste of winning. We bring out Celipede, hit a Psychic, and A-Drive has been conquered once and for all. My Mons and I start jumping with joy as we hear the sound of A-Drive's 1 million subscribers all racing to subscribe to us instead. The run is over. The result? The same as always, folks. Victory! I won't lie to you, I definitely didn't expect to be able to put together a team this strong with only bug types to fuse with. Without the huge power of Zuma Sect, without the early carrying capacity of Sepzor, or even the ability to set up hazards with Empatris, I don't think this run finishes at all. The pieces just seem to fall perfectly into place, which is why this Hall of Fame registration feels just a little bit special. And that, ladies and gents, is our Pokemon Infinite Fusion, Bug Fusions only, Hardcore Nuzlocke. Quite the mouthful. If you made it all the way here, make sure to subscribe, share the video with your friends, like the video, and leave a comment telling us which run we should do next. You guys loving these videos keeps me going through all the long, long hours of editing, and I couldn't make these without you. Thank you again. We'll see you on the next one. Nuzlocke Dad, out.